Sure. So uh, the optical genome mapping, it's a fairly novel technology. It's a non sequencing based technology for um, identification of uh, structure variants within the um, whole genome. Um, so basically, uh, we know that these structure variants are pretty hard to identify uh, for the reason that there are repeat sequences in the human genome. In fact, nearly half of the human genome is composed of repeat sequences. So when we try to identify structure variants um, using a high throughput technology like a short read next generation sequencing, what happens is we break the DNA down into short fragments and when we realign it, the uh, res uh, at the you know usually structure variants happen at the regions of repeat sequences. So when we at the time of realignment, we lose that information about the structure variants, which is why it's been kind of hard to identify a fairly good technology where we are able to pick out these structure variants. We know that these are extremely important. Structure chromosomal variants are in fact more important than mutations in a prognostication of all myeloid neoplasms, myelodysplastic syndromes, acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, et cetera. And uh, so now uh, we now, using the optical genome mapping, we, uh, we are fortunate to have some sort of a high resolution technology to identify uh, these variants that go way beyond the conventional karyotyping. Now, based on the limitations I mentioned earlier, those have been the main reasons that the conventional banding or conventional cytogenetics, what we uh, speak of, has remained the gold standard for years and years. But now I think using this, um, this actually prompted us to kind of explore the use of optical genome mapping to not only identify these high resolution abnormalities, but also to see if they mean something clinically, whether they are prognostic or whether they have any therapeutic importance. Yeah, that, that's a wonderful question. Uh, we have uh, actually, first of all, the publication, we are very fortunate that it's gaining attention from uh, several other experts who have reached out and kind of uh, wanting to actually have this uh, technology in their own labs. So that's really a positive sign. Uh, we have uh, several other publications as well. So this we identified this mainly focusing on myelodysplastic syndromes. We also have a multi-center study that we published in blood advances in acute myeloid leukemia, uh, where we actually showed the concordance with conventional banding, as well as uh, these additional abnormalities that actually are prognostic. Uh, it was just published a few months before. We also have um, international working groups. So as you know, this is fairly novel technology, so it took a lot of time and effort to kind of um, clean it up and make it uh, easily applicable for clinical use. And uh, in addition to us, there are a few other centers who are kind of making headways with this. So we decided to form an international working group of the optical genome mapping users in order to help other users to bring them up. So we are kind of uh, having regular meetings and providing um, a framework and guidelines and recommendations for others, other users to explore uh, this technology in their own patients to see the value and, and share it, uh, share their experience as well. So, so that's a great question, actually. So in, um, it actually is a right uh, point of time to bring this issue up, although we didn't discreetly describe it in our study. So, so we're all aware that uh, this year we had the two different systems of classification, the WHO, which I was for fortunate to be a part of that classification and the international consensus classification. Both of these provided these updated uh, diagnostic subclassification of hematologic malignancies, AML included. So, uh, you know, these groups worked independently, but despite that, they came to a consensus uh, one being that both systems move forward with a genomic-based classification, which means the underlying genomic abnormality trumps uh, what we see uh, by morphology or clinical. So that's 
really important. So what happened was in my, if you look at the um, myelodysplastic syndromes, there are specific abnormalities in the presence of which the diagnosis is automatically updated to acute myeloid leukemia. So if we go back to our cohort, we identified using optical genome mapping several abnormalities that were actually cryptic by conventional carrier type. For example, the MECOM rearrangements, the NUP98 rearrangements, the KMT2A rearrangements. These were all, um, we know, the whole community knows that these are cryptic unless you targeted uh, unless you perform a targeted fish to identify that, you probably miss it. But based on the updated classification criteria, the presence itself is AML defining. So when we went back to our cohort, we identified that nearly 7% of the uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, what was traditionally called as myelodysplastic syndrome, presented with low blasts, which is why it was diagnosed as myelodysplastic syndrome, is actually an AML diagnosis based on the new criteria. So that that is actually um, uh, important because the OGM, uh, in short, it provides an unbiased analysis of the entire genome. We don't have to do multiple targeted fish to look for these abnormalities. In fact, there are more than 30 abnormalities listed as AML defining in the updated classification, and it's kind of impossible for the laboratory to do 30 fish studies, right? So uh, this would provide a complete unbiased whole genome view of all of these structured aberrations to not only define AML appropriately, but if you uh, read our paper, you also see that we used all these additional findings that we had from the OGM. Uh, the important question is, what do they mean? Of course, we can identify more, it's a high resolution, but do they mean something clinically? So we applied the um, a revised IPSS prognostication criteria using the data from OGM on our patients. And we saw that the uh, scoring, uh, the risk scores actually changed in 20% of the patients, so more than 20 actually. And in addition, not in, in addition, there were some abnormalities like MECOM rearrangements that's actually actionable, not only because it changes the diagnosis now, but because there are clinical trials to target these abnormalities. So I think the implications are huge uh, for OGM in uh, profiling of myeloid neoplasms, and we are just beginning to see, uh, you know, the uh, the initial phases of it.